one small thing. Yeah. When you bring me out, can you introduce me as Joker, baby? What's wrong with your real name? What is up, everybody, and welcome back to the Kino Corner. I don't know about you, but I am feeling great. I'm feeling amazing. My channel has really blown up this summer. I've done super well, and really, it's all thanks to you. So as a thank you, I'm going to cover a movie that a lot of people have been suggesting to me in DMs and comments, and that is Joker. Yes, I will finally be covering Joker, and I want to open up with some maybe controversial questions. Both Joker and Parasite came out in the same year and touched on very similar themes of class inequality, but which did it better? Parasite was obviously more critically acclaimed, and it rose to the top of Letterboxd, whereas the people on Letterboxd didn't exactly like Joker. But Joker was much more successful if we look at the box office. So does that mean that Joker was a better vehicle for these messages and ideas because it did appeal more to the masses? Or is Parasite better because it became a media darling and among the intelligentsia is definitely more liked than Joker? But let's think. Parasite ends with the return to the status quo, whereas Joker doesn't. The elite, the people in power, would probably like the ending of Parasite a lot more. And I don't remember a media narrative calling Parasite a call to action for incels. But I'm just asking questions. Please don't cancel me. I, I'm just asking questions. I know some of you Parasite fans are, are rabid, but you know, it's just, I mean, it's a film discussion, right? It's... Hello? Yeah? Okay, oh, okay, I'll, ch I'll, I'll, I'll check those out. So sorry, I'm, re I'm recording. No, no, I'll do, I'll do it now. Okay, I'll get my headphones. So it seems that the whole YouTube commentary channel has already heard everything that I said, and I'm being canceled. But you know what? Maybe it's just criticism. For this video, we'll just listen to it together, and I'll respond, and I'll be a big man. And so, just give me one second, and we'll enjoy everything together. I'm Turkey Tom, and today we're going to talk about two things, the Kino Corner and criticism. I'll be calling him Kino for the rest of this video. Kino sprung up in the wake of the success of channels like Every Frame of Painting, Nerdwriter One, and the Royal Ocean Film Society. He secured his niche in that genre of YouTube video essay by focusing on how movies were made, and how that can affect how we view them. Don't get me wrong, I like his videos and the new perspective to these movies he gives me, and I also appreciate that often he introduces me to great films I otherwise wouldn't have heard about. But, for compliments, that's about all I have. Time to go back on everything I just said and make this whiny, obnoxious, petulant child hate me. Very simply, one of the worst channels ever made. Anyone who pretends to have enjoyed watching this YouTuber, and believe me, we both know you're pretending, Kido has what is referred to as a bad taste. There is a bad taste, and now someone with bad taste is not a bad taste. Bad 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 the Kino Corner, you're cancelled! <laughs> Perhaps the most talked about film of 2019, and arguably the most memed film of 2019, though in today's internet culture, those things do tend to go hand in hand, was Joker. The film, made only for $55 million, which is a whole lot of money to me, but is a fraction of the cost of most superhero movies, didn't even have any superheroes in it, and it made over a billion dollars in profit. No, instead it showcases a villain and it humanizes the villain so that we might understand his perspective, struggles, and motivations. This hasn't been done in a major motion picture since Despicable Me, so needless to say, audiences were hungry for this kind of story. Despite Joker being one of the hottest topics on, well, the whole internet several months ago, I decided to stay away from discussing this movie until the dust had settled. Now that we're worried about riots and wars and world destruction, I think it's a good time to dive into this movie and look at its merits as well as address some common criticisms. Joker definitely shocked the film world by winning the top prize at the Venice Film Festival, something unprecedented for a comic book movie, and a lot of the people who showed hatred towards Joker directed their disdain to its director, Todd Phillips. But why? Well, Todd Phillips isn't exactly the most, how should I put it, critically acclaimed director. 
No, I think his most acclaimed film is still The Hangover, but if you ask me, I prefer old school. He made dumb comedies for his entire career, so his shift to Joker felt weird. <laughs> but isn't Joker a serious movie about a mentally ill man succumbing to madness and chaos? <laughs> yes, it is, but it's also a comedy. <sighs> or maybe it's an anti-comedy. The most basic definition of comedy is a story where the protagonist is at a better place at the end than he was at the beginning and at the end of the Joker, and I would say spoiler warning, but all of you have seen it by now. But at the end of Joker, Arthur has finally embraced his true self. He's out of the hovel in which he lives, and he's no longer surrounded by the people who abuse him, and he's getting the treatment he needs. He might be enacting his villainy on the people working at the mental hospital, and all the treatment may be for naught, but he is in a better place, isn't he? And the film is funny, not in a ha-ha sort of way, but in a dark way. If it wasn't funny, would it be memed as much? Maybe, but who cares? I personally love the punchline to the joke that starts with, how about another joke, Murray? <laughs> that one killed me. So it's another comedy gold mine from Todd Phillips. It's definitely funnier than The Hangover Part 3, but if I was to list all the films that were funnier than The Hangover Part 3, well, I'd be doing a 30-part series on the history of cinema. But why do so many people love this movie while well, so many other people despise it? Let's first talk about why people love it. Maybe it was the perfect timing that Joker released when it did, since it came out mere months after Avengers Endgame released, which Endgame, if I don't need to explain to you, but it was the culmination of over 20 movies that released over the course of 11 years. Meaning that for the last decade, there's been more than one MCU film each year, all of which were major blockbusters. Add to that the DC movies, the Fox Marvel movies, the Sony Spider-Man movies, and all the other assorted superhero films that came out and the genre became. But if you ask me, he was tired long ago. Who wants to watch movies about men in latex fighting bad guys when you could be watching films about well-dressed men wearing clown makeup? What was hilarious is that everyone I know preferred Infinity War to Endgame. People liked Thanos. The heroes, they're boring, but the villains, what I'm saying is that people wanted a change from the tried and true formula of the boring dude that has powers and he has to face a bad guy and he almost loses at the end of act two, but he comes back stronger than ever to defeat the evil and return everything to the status quo. That may be why people rush to see a comic book movie about a man succumbing to his darkness, where his actions don't restore the status quo, but they throw the status quo out the window in favor of pure chaos. When we see these superheroes on the screen, they're like gods. They've been gifted these powers for one reason or another, but these powers aren't reserved for people like you or me. And if they don't have powers, well, they have a lot of money. The Captain Americas, Thors, and Iron Mans exist in the pantheon of supers who exist above normal society. Maybe we would strive to be like them if they weren't so dull. The problems they deal with are on a scale that we can't even imagine. They're, they're large, they're global, they're cosmic. Scales we don't deal with on an everyday basis or at all. Arthur Fleck, he doesn't deal with anything apocalyptic. He just deals with people being dicks to him. It's not just him. It is getting crazier out there. Even though the film takes place in the 70s when crime and violence was rampant in places like New York City, it hits close to home for those of us living in 2019 and 2020. Social isolation, depression, anxiety, and a number of other personal issues wreak havoc on Arthur as he struggles to keep a job and care for his mom. He looks anorexic. Is it because he doesn't want to eat or he can't afford to eat? The cinematography helps create a feeling of loneliness and isolation. 
Phillips and cinematographer Lawrence Scher shot the film on the Ari Alexa LF, the Ari Mini LF, and the Ari Alexa 65, all of which sport top of the line, large format sensors. The large sensor size doesn't necessarily create a shallower depth of field, but shooting practices when shooting on larger formats usually cause a shallower depth of field. I'll link an article about it in the description. But anyways, they paired the large format digital cinema cameras with vintage lenses to keep the film grounded in a grittier, more analog look. On top of that, they color graded the film using a LUT that emulated the Kodak 5293 film stock. That all created the grimy look of Joker, and it also helped create the striking shallowness. And no, not in the story, like what all the letterbox reviews would say, but in its look. The shallow depth of field puts us in Arthur's state of mind. He's in a city surrounded by people, sure, but everyone else is out of focus. He might as well be the only person in Gotham. It's sometimes hard to understand or make out the world around him as it tends to be blurry. But just as it's hard for him to understand his whole world, it's hard for us to understand his. People in modern society, young men especially, are feeling more and more disenfranchised and not just socially isolated, but socially exiled. It's like with the rise of the internet, there's been a rise in people essentially dropping out of society. People aren't happy. And you know what? <laughs> of all people, Todd Phillips understood that. All he had to do was hold up a mirror to society, which Hollywood didn't want to do. They just want to further distance themselves from anything and anyone that isn't like them. And he knew that we would eat it up. Joker, for as flawed and evil as he may be, is a man of the people. He's an embodiment of our social malaise and our desire to just burn everything down and start over. He's not a villain, not by any stretch of the imagination. No, he's a victim of a sick society. He's a symptom of a disease. In the film, all he has to do is defend himself against three Wall Street types in order to kickstart a revolution. A revolution he had no part in. Society was a powder keg and he just happened to be standing nearby and he dropped a match. I think Joker has aged quite well in this last year for obvious reasons, but I don't say that with glee, but with sadness. One of the biggest criticisms I've heard of Joker since its release is that it was a ripoff of Taxi Driver and or The King of Comedy. Well, people, those are very different films. So which one is it? Let's break this down. The King of Comedy comparisons are obvious as they both deal with late night television and Robert De Niro is in both of them. I don't think it was a coincidence that Phillips cast De Niro as Murray or Murray. I think he welcomed the comparisons, but let's look at this like people who've actually seen both movies. The King of Comedy follows a wannabe comedian, Rupert Pupkin, who obsesses over a late night TV host, Jerry Langford. Basically, it's Jerry Lewis playing as himself. Pupkin fantasizes about them as friends and colleagues, and he wants nothing more in the world than to have his own variety show. This obsession leads to him kidnapping Langford and hijacking the show. I see the influences, okay. But it's really nothing like Joker, except for the whole late night show thing. But these kinds of shows are prevalent in our society. Does any movie that deals with a man wanting to be on a late night show count as a clone of the King of Comedy? The King of Comedy is a satire about the entertainment industry. Pupkin means no ill will towards Langford. In fact, he really just wants to be friends with him. He fantasizes, sure, but doesn't every dreamer? <sighs> Pupkin knows that his fantasies are just fantasies. Arthur Fleck doesn't. Fleck doesn't want to be friends with Murray. He wants a father figure, having never known his real father. He looks up to Murray, idolizes him, imagines him as this nice guy who went all through the same struggles as he did. He sees him as someone, and possibly the only person, who can relate to him on a human level. But Murray betrays Fleck's trust when he plays the clip of Fleck performing at the comedy club just to mock him. Fleck realizes that Murray is just as sick as everyone else. And even though it takes place in the past, 
it plays into the internet phenomenon of lol cows, in which people who are often not of sound mind are endlessly mocked online, Chris Chan being the obvious example. Pair this endless mocking with Thomas Wayne, who Fleck thinks is his real father, rudely cutting him down and revealing to him that his mother is delusional and a liar. Well, then you might have a man whose whole world is falling apart. Pupkin went on to the late night show to become a star, and so did Fleck in a way. But Fleck's mission was to hurt everyone who hurt him, and Murray had simply put himself at the top of the list. Fleck, I mean Joker, did want to perform for people, to make people laugh. And I guess he did, in some perverse way. But the stories of these two films are nothing alike past some superficial similarities. They don't even look like each other. The King of Comedy has a lot of soft lights and pleasing colors, while Joker looks grimy, with lots of greens, reds, and browns oozing on the screen. It's a color scheme closer to Taxi Driver's, but Taxi Driver is gritty and grainy, while Joker does have more of a sleek look due to it being shot digitally and on a large format sensor. And people like to say that Joker is a knockoff of Taxi Driver, but I really don't get this one. Travis Bickle is a vigilante. He sees the degeneracy and rampant crime of 1970s New York, and he also sees nobody trying to stop it. He takes the law into his own hands, imagining himself as some Western hero. And he tries to rid the city of corruption by assassinating the politician that he doesn't like and also saving the damsel in distress from the brothel. He's a weird, delusional, and self-obsessed and self-unaware loner, as evidenced by him bringing the woman on a date to an adult cinema. But what he wants is order. Fleck, to, Fleck doesn't stand for anything, but he enjoys the chaos that he causes. In fact, I'd say that he wants the chaos. The streets of Gotham are bad, and Fleck complains about them, but he doesn't work to make them better. No, he just accelerates their degradation. The main crux of Fleck's descent is his inability to get his pills to control his psychoses, so his delusions throw his whole world into a tailspin. We see all these delusions with him, and we believe them to be real as well. So we're as confused as Fleck as to what the nature of reality is. Fleck lashes out at a nonsensical world that treats him like crap. He's not working towards some higher purpose. He just wants to hurt those who hurt him. So Joker is more like the antithesis to Taxi Driver. Bickle wants order. Fleck wants chaos. And it's poetic in a way that the external reflects the internal that as Joker dives deeper and deeper into madness, so does Gotham. And I have some criticisms of my own, like I think that it has a bit too much of the Waynes. But still, it's a Scorsese-like movie disguised as a comic book film. And think about it. It made millions and millions of people go to the cinemas to see a movie made in the tradition of New Hollywood. And that's pretty cool. Wait, I thought you cancelled me. No, I was recruiting you. Are you in? I'm in. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to create utter frickin' chaos.